Hi everyone, thank you for joining today. We will get started on the hour. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining today. Welcome to the NOAA Omics Seminar Series. I'm your host, Nicole Miller, and I sit in NOAA Ocean Exploration. Omics, 
which is a suite of tools used to analyze DNA, RNA, proteins, and metabolites, has become a large priority here at NOAA in the past few years. We've established this seminar series in an effort to increase transparency and collaboration and highlight the incredible omics-related research currently underway both within and outside NOAA. The seminars from this series are made available on YouTube and posted on our OMICS website. There should be a link to the website in the chat now. As participants, you are muted, but feel free to type questions for the que in the questions for staff box throughout the presentation. At the end, I will read the questions for the presenters to answer. So with that, our presentation today is titled eDNA dominant marine fish species characterize coastal habitats, an eDNA based classifier approach to aid marine biogeography and ocean monitoring by Dr. Mark Stokel and Jesse Ozabel. I'm going to provide uh, screen sharing positions to Mark. while I cover some um, backgrounds. Mark Stokel is the senior research uh, is a senior research associate in the program for human environment at Rockefeller University. Beginning in 2003, he helped organize the early meetings that laid the foundation for the DNA barcoding initiative. His DNA barcoding projects with high school students attracted front page coverage in the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal. Since 2015, he has been researching environmental DNA in the New York Bite as a tool for monitoring marine animal populations. He established a DNA study of the Lower Hudson River estuary in 2019. And in collaboration with the New York, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, Stokel led the first large scale bottom trawl eDNA comparison with, with results published in 2021. Jesse Ozubel directs the Rockefeller University's Program for in Human Environment, or PHE, which aims to elaborate the technical vision of a large, prosperous society that emits little harm and spares large amounts of land and sea for nature. Mr. Ozubel initiated and helped lead the Census of Marine Life, Barcode of Life Initiative, and ongoing international quiet ocean experiment. In 2018, the Rockefeller University's Program for Human Environment hosted the first U.S. National Conference on Marine eDNA, and Mr. Ozubel is an and Mr. Ozubel is an adjunct scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, a fellow at the a fellow of resources for the future and a member of NOAA's Science Advisory Board. Thank you, Mark and Jesse, for joining and presenting us today. I will now pass it off to you. Uh, thank you, Nicole. I'm gonna share our recent work using eDNA dominant fish species to characterize coastal habitats. The eDNA-based classifier approach that we describe has potential to aid marine biogeography and ocean monitoring. There is a growing need for timely, locally relevant biological monitoring of the ocean. First, today's ocean is, is an Anthropocene ocean with increasing human impacts, including wind power installations and offshore aquaculture facilities. Second, traditional surveys are relatively expensive and sometimes destructive. This limits the extent and frequency of monitoring. Many areas are surveyed rarely or not at all. Censusing methods differ by habitat and target species. This limits comparability between surveys. What we would like to have is robust ecosystem monitoring using a multi-species approach that provides up-to-date spatially detailed assessments of marine life. We think that fish eDNA abundance profiles offer a new approach to biological monitoring of the ocean. And we think that fish eDNA profiles will be a widely useful complement to traditional surveys. 
What makes this approach new is a combination of eDNA as a standard technology, focusing only on the most abundant taxa as a standard measure, and using FISH as a standard taxon. Advantages of this approach are it is applicable in all habitats, it's relatively low cost with absent harm to organisms of the environment, and it's applicable to traditional survey data, enabling integration of eDNA with traditional surveys. How we analyze marine fish eDNA. All analyses were done with metabarcoding using primers that amplify the 110 base pair RIA segment of the vertebrate mitochondrial 12S gene. RIA's primers amplify eDNA of bony fish, but not cartilaginous fish due to a primer mismatch. So all the data I will show are for bony fish. The RIA segment is immediately adjacent to the myfish segment of 12S, which is also commonly used in fish metabarcoding studies. In our experience, RIA's primers amplify bony fish eDNA with relatively little primer bias among species and eDNA reads are closely proportional to eDNA abundance. And based on the work of many laboratories, eDNA abundance is roughly proportional to fish abundance. To quantify eDNA, we use a modification of a spike-in approach pioneered by Masayuki Ushio and colleagues. We add a known amount of a non-fish standard to each PCR. The standard we use is an amplicon of Oster's 12S, that has the same RIAS primer binding sites as FISH. This allows us to calculate the number of eDNA copies by comparing FISH reads to standard reads. Our starting hypothesis is that eDNA dominant FISH species characterize coastal habitats. To test this hypothesis, we designated the 10 most abundant bony FISH species in terms of eDNA copies or reads as eDNA dominant species, or eDDS. We then ask three questions. First, do eDDS differ among sites? Second, are they consistent with insights? And third, are they concordant with traditional capture assessments of fish abundance? We looked at four sets of survey data. These two are, are published, and these two are recent unpublished data. The sets include a Barnegat Bay two-year eDNA time series, the 2019-2020 New Jersey Ocean Trawl eDNA survey conducted in collaboration with New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. The survey extends along about 200 kilometers of the New Jersey coastline and covers about 4,000 square kilometers. An East River four-month eDNA time series and the 2022 Raritan Bay SANE eDNA survey conducted in collaboration with New Jersey DEP along 36 kilometers of the southern shoreline of Raritan Bay. The two survey collaborations with New Jersey DEP include fish catch data. So for these, we can directly compare eDNA with traditional assessment. We found that fish eDNA follows a classic hollow curve species abundance distribution, or SAD. This is the most important finding. Everything else I'm going to talk about arises from the fact that fish eDNA follows a hollow curve species abundance distribution. A hollow curve SAD is not unexpected. In fact, to quote Brian McGill and colleagues, SADs follow one of ecology's oldest and most universal laws. Every community shows a hollow curve or hyperbolic shape on a histogram with many rare species and just a few common species. Here are uh, species abundance distributions for three surveys, New Jersey Trawl, East River, and Raritan Bay. Each column is a species and species are ranked by decreasing abundance in terms of eDNA copies per liter. The eDNA scale differs among sites. The caret indicates the 10th most abundant species and the total number of species at each site is shown at the end of the x-axis. At each site, eDNA follows a hollow curve distribution 
a few species make up the great majority of eDNA, and the remainder are relatively rare. We designated the top 10 as eDNA dominant species, eDDS. These make up 96%, 92%, and 97% of total bony fish eDNA in these surveys. The dominant species for each site are listed in decreasing order of abundance. They're colorized according to whether they're site specific or shared among sites. Blue, New Jersey trawl, orange, East River, green, Raritan Bay, and gray shared. The 12S amplicon we use for metamarketing does not distinguish some regional species. These include Atlantic Manhattan and the Elosa herrings, uh, alewife, blueback, and American shad, uh, the Europhysis hakes, red, white, and spotted, and black drum and spot. The mathematical nature of SADs was first analyzed by Fisher and colleagues in 1943 and Preston in 1948. Fisher proposed that species follow a log series distribution, and Preston proposed they follow a log normal distribution. These continue to be leading candidates as mathematical models. However, despite over 70 years of research, the factors that create and maintain SADs are unknown. So in answer to my first question, yes, eDNA dominant species differ among sites. Regarding the second question, we found that dominant species were consistent within sites. We took the classifications generated from these three sites and applied those to total fish eDNA in pool data and in individual water samples or same days and normalized the results in each case to 100%. In these plots, eDDS taxa are colored or gray, and any gap at the top of a column represents the non-eDDS taxa. In New Jersey trawl pool data, about 40% of fish eDNA was New Jersey trawl specific eDDS, about 50% was shared taxa, and a very small percentage was Raritan Bay eDDS. Individual water samples gave a similar result in that New Jersey trawl specific plus shared eDDS made up nearly all fish eDNA and trawl specific taxa were more abundant than other site specific taxa in all individual samples. Similarly for the East River and Raritan Bay, in pool data about 40% of fish eDNA was site specific, 50% was shared taxa and a small percentage was other site specific eDDS. For East River and Raritan Bay, site-specific plus shared taxa made up more than 80% of the total fish eDNA in nearly all individual samples and same days, and site-specific taxa correctly classified uh, all individual water samples in nearly all same days. Regarding the third question, eDNA dominant species were consistent with abundance according to traditional capture data. We took classifications generated by comparing eDNA among the three sites and applied those to New Jersey trawl and Raritan Bay catch data and normalized the results in each analysis to 100%. New Jersey trawl records are by weight and same records are number of individuals. In pool data, the proportions by capture are approximately uh, the same as those with eDNA. That's true for the uh, trawl and it's true for the same uh, data. And also similar to eDNA, same site specific plus shared taxa made up more than 80% of most individual trawls in same days and same site specific taxa were more abundant than other site specific taxa in individual trawls in nearly all same days. We also looked at abundance by individual species. These are the plots we just looked at showing proportions in eDNA and catch data. And on the right are the same data sets analyzed by individual species. So these plots compare eDNA abundance on the y-axis to trawl weight or same individuals on the x-axis. Each comparison is shown in linear and log scale. There's good correlation between species eDNA abundance and species fish abundance, stronger in the linear scale plots, but also present in log scale comparisons. 
We think that this approach could be used to classify new sites. The idea is to take profiles generated from one set of sites and apply them to a new area. This method has potential advantages as compared to traditional beta diversity metrics. Beta diversity metrics are what are used to compare diversity in one site to that in another site. Advantages include that you don't need to reanalyze the original data when you're applying eDNA profiles to a new data set. And also profile graphics directly represent species abundance. And so are potentially understandable to a wider audience than plots generated with NMDS or principal components analysis, which involve multi-dimensional scaling with virtual axes. To test this approach, we designated these three profiles as representing coastal, rocky, and estuary habitat. Here we applied uh, the profiles generated from the three original sites to a two-year eDNA time series, sorry, uh, to a two-year eDNA time series uh, from Raritan Bay, from Barnegat Bay, which is about 100 kilometers south of Raritan Bay. The result was that Barnegat Bay looks like an estuary, which makes sense because it is an estuary. Estuary-specific plus shared tax have made up more than 80% of the eDNA reads in pool data and in most individual water samples. And estuary-specific tax that were more abundant than rocky or coastal-specific tax in pool and nearly all individual water samples. This analysis adds another demonstration of how dominant species are relatively consistent with insights. And consistency with insights implies that modest sampling is sufficient to characterize dominant species at a site. Here we applied profiles from the original three sites to catch weights from the Maine, New Hampshire inshore trawl survey of fall 2019. And I thank Rebecca Peters for providing access to this data. This survey involved 120 trawls along about 400 kilometers of Maine and New Hampshire coastline and covered about 14,000 square kilometers. Trawl weights followed a hollow curve SAD with the top 10 species making up about 94% of trawl catches, or a total of 43 species uh, in the trawl. Four of the main top 10 highlighted here in blue were also part of New Jersey coastal specific EDDS. So similarity between New Jersey and Maine makes sense. These are both Northwest Atlantic coastal sites. Five dominant taxa highlighted here in tan were specific to the Maine survey. And the proportions of New Jersey and Maine specific uh, taxa were similar in all regions. So regions one, two, three, four, five, uh, the proportions are similar in, in those sites. And I, this similarity among regions is another demonstration of consistency in abundant species over a very large area. The New Jersey to Maine distance is about 450 miles or 700 kilometers. It should be possible and interesting to map the boundaries of Maine versus New Jersey dominant taxa. Profiles can also be applied to analyze seasonal differences. Here we defined EDDS by proportion of reads from New Jersey Troll eDNA survey January 2020 and August 2019. The dominant species are listed here and are colored blue if winter specific and yellow if summer specific. These classifications were then applied to eDNA data and to trawl weights. Season specific plus shared taxa made up more than 80% of pooled eDNA reads and pooled trawl weights, and more than 80% of most individual water samples and most individual trawls. All water samples of nearly all trawls were correctly classified by season-specific taxa. This analysis demonstrates nearly complete turnover of fish populations between winter and summer. It also provides more evidence of congruence between eDNA and trawl assessments of abundant species. Uh, profiles work on the West Coast as well. This looks at published eDNA data sets 
from two excellent studies by Zach Gold and colleagues. The first was conducted at three rocky reef sites separated by about six kilometers on one of the Channel Islands in Southern California. The second was conducted at the same, in the same region at 18 sandy surf zone sites distributed along 200 kilometers of the coast and on four of the Channel Islands, which are about 30 kilometers offshore. eDNA dominant species are listed here in colored blue for rocky reef specific and yellow for sandy surf zone specific. And uh, the classifications were then applied to pool data here and to individual uh, sites. There were three rocky reef sites, three collections at each site, and there were 18 sandy surf zone sites. As with East Coast data, eDNA followed a hollow curve distribution, and eDDS profiles differed among habitats and were consistent within habitats. Dominant species profiles can also be derived from traditional data. This shows dominant species profiles generated from New Jersey trawl catch weights in January and August 1999. Here again, blue is winter specific and yellow is summer specific. We applied these classifications to 2009 and 2019 trawl weights. And according to this analysis, winter and summer dominant species were mostly unchanged over 20 years. An extensive ecology literature supports inference that SADs characterize habitats. Hollow curve SADs are universal stable features of ecosystems. Their best models is log normal distributions, which appears inconsistent with neutral theory and implies that abundance reflects species biology and not random processes. They're stable over time and space, even for very large habitats, which also implies that abundance reflects species biology and not random processes. So to summarize, eDNA dominant fish species characterize coastal habitats. Limitations to the current protocol include the RIAS 12S amplicon is identical among some regional species, which may obscure differences between samples or sites. The standard RIAS primers don't work for sharks and rays. You can get around this limitation using modified RIAS primers that do amplify sharks and rays. Classifications group species, which may obscure differences between samples or sites. Designating top 10 as EDDS is arbitrary and may, may include uncommon species. The methodology deliberately ignores rare species, which may include threatened or invasive taxa that are of particular interest. The protocol assesses fish only. Other groups may have different habitat boundaries. We haven't specifically analyzed habitat boundaries so far. We've only looked at temperate zone coastal habitats, and we've done limited statistical testing so far. Looking ahead, we think that fish eDNA abundance profiles offer a new approach to marine biogeography and ocean monitoring. And we think that fish eDNA profiles will be a widely useful complement to traditional surveys. The, uh, the advantages include it's applicable in all habitats, relatively low cost, absent harm, and applicable to traditional survey data, enabling integration. Thank you. I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Jesse Osadel. Thank you, Mark. We'll go ahead and hear from Jesse now. We're all good to go, Jesse. As far as uh, slides go. Oh, Jesse, and you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. okay. Hello, Nicole. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and hello, everybody. I'd now like to go back about uh, 25 years to the start of the Census of Marine Life Program, which some of you uh, in, the, in the webinar were involved in. And one of the great questions then was, uh, could we come up with a better uh, ecological geography of the sea, or better zoogeography, uh, better definitions. 
Uh, and here you see uh, uh, some classics uh, in this field, uh, the Ekman's book, uh, Alan Longhurst's book. Alan was involved in the early days of, of the, the census. Uh, also the work, a lot of which came out of the University of Rhode Island by Ken Sherman on large marine ecosystems. So these were efforts uh, using different princ principles, uh, different uh, theory, uh, and some data, not all that much data, really to try to bound either polygons on the surface of the ocean or parcels or, or boxes of water uh, in, uh, in three dimensions. Uh, let me now show you a few examples of what people did at that time and still today. Uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN in, in Rome, which is uh, uh, within the UN system, responsible for, for uh, fisheries and aquaculture and data about them. In order to aggregate data, in order to speak about the status of uh, ecosystems, marine ecosystems, uh, uh, has uh, developed a set of, uh, of uh, fishing areas, what they call the major fishing areas. Uh, these are based uh, uh, partly on catch data, but a lot of it is uh, just jurisdictional relating to, uh, to groups of countries that, uh, that uh, share borders and may meet together to talk about, uh, about different kinds of issues. And these data are used in quite a few of the, the fisheries management agreements. Uh, they're, they're important. But if you're obviously looking at them, uh, there isn't much biological basis to them. Second example, large marine ecosystems. Uh, I mentioned Ken Sherman in the University of Rhode Island. Uh, uh, you see a, a globe map, a, a spherical map on the left, uh, and uh, some of the ecosystems uh, on the right. Uh, largely coastal, uh, based again on a mix of hydrography, submarine pr uh, topography, uh, productivity, uh, in some cases catch data. Uh, uh, and these uh, we, the, the, the ended up with, uh, 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 I think, finally about 40 or so uh, uh, eventually. But here you can see 20 that the Global Environment Facility of the UN actually, uh, of the World Bank, actually uh, allocated money for, for uh, uh, coastal zone management, regional seas management, and again, uh, interesting and useful in some ways, but not with much uh, biological basis. I mentioned Alan Longhurst, uh, a great scientist, and Alan struggled uh, to develop his classification. Uh, it ended up being 56 four-letter geocodes. Uh, he used a lot of biogeochemical information, uh, focused on the pelagic environment, uh, and here you see uh, his regions, uh, which again have been used to uh, uh, to model uh, various questions uh, to try to understand uh, uh, distribution of uh, of uh, marine life. Uh, uh, and again, you see it's a uh, uh, very, I'd say, from a biological point of view, in the end. Uh, uh, rather uneven in terms of the uh, uh, how it's uh, the, the level of precision, accuracy, and so forth. Uh, a fourth example, the most uh, more recent, uh, Miao, uh, uh, Mark Spaulding, and others uh, uh, put together uh, together with uh, some major conservation organizations, Nature Conservancy, and others, uh, a set of Boundaries, again, uh, 50 or so uh, of these Miao regions, uh, mostly coastal, uh, and uh, again, based on uh, some uh, currents, catches, uh, uh, but actually very little real uh, uh, bio biological data in that sense. Again, mostly uh, polygons drawn for, for other reasons not because they really correspond to uh, the way the marine life is, is distributed. And finally, an uh, effort by, led by Mark uh, Costello, uh, now in Norway, I think, uh, formerly of Ireland and New Zealand. And Mark very much, and his colleagues very much to their credit, uh, also used data from, on endemicity from OBIS, from the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, to try to develop a, an alternative classification. Uh, 
and again, one can see some some uh, logic to the, these, but uh, uh, obviously, again, the scale, it's, uh, the, there's a lot that's, uh, that's uh, arbitrary. So w the authors I've mentioned and others over the last hundreds, thousands of years, one could say, have struggled to, to either define polygons on the ocean surface or define uh, boxes or, or parcels of water that actually correspond to, to biology. And what Mark and I believe, as Mark suggested, is that eDNA may offer a breakthrough for defining in a bottom-up inductive way actual marine regions, marine bioregions, and using actual biological data. Now, as Mark said, in fact, one could do this with the with, uh, catch data or trawl data, not with, I wouldn't say catch with trawl data, with trawls or seines, but the cost and the effort of doing it, of having enough samples to do it uh, has been prohibitive. So the possibility to do the eDNA measurements frequently and with a greater spatial density, uh, but also integrate them where one has the, 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 the uh, trawl data or other sampling data, uh, of course, makes it historically uh, attractive for look at doing retrospectives. And as Mark pointed out, it draws strength from the ubiquitous steep hollow curve distributions, which are characteristic, again, not just of, uh, of fish, but uh, almost, of, uh, I'd say, of pretty much all forms of life that ecologists have studied, uh, terrestrial and marine. If distributions abundance were relatively flat, if the the top 20 species of fish or sponges uh, or arthropods, take your pick, or, or uh, 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 birds uh, were about the same, if, if numbers one through 20 all had, let's say, an abundance of about 100, then the rankings wouldn't have much significance, and the, the, the they would the positions would jump up, jump around. So number twelve could move quickly up to number four, uh, number four could drop down to number nineteen. But the hollow curve distributions, the steepness of it, uh, may mean that the the distributions are going to be relatively relatively stable. And again, they while uh, we focused on fish, we are we would. Uh, assert or hypothesize that if one used other taxa, one would get similar uh, kinds of, uh, of results. So the underlying, one could say the two or 300 years of underlying ecology uh, supports uh, uh, this approach. Very importantly, all the same method can be used for all parcels of water. Uh, Whereas uh, in shallow water, maybe one may be using quadrats and, and uh, snorkels or scuba, and in other places, uh, seines or, or uh, uh, trawls, and other places, traps on the sea floor, benthic cores, uh, acoustics. The eDNA works everywhere. It works in a, in a, uh, a tidal pool. It works in the Mariana Trench. So the uh, there's the great advantage that the method will be consistent across all parcels of water. It can address the benthos in the water column. It can address the deep sea and near shore. It can also be applied over a range of spatial scales. So if one wants to divide the ocean into, let's say, 25 boxes that have family resemblance, uh, one could do that, or 250 or 2,500. Uh, so uh, there's uh, there's no... Uh, if one, as one wants to to uh, uh, add detail, uh, add precision, uh, one can uh, zoom in closer, uh, and uh, the, the 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 method should still work. As Mark showed, it can address seasonality, uh, which has always been vexing. Uh, the the water moves and the animals move, uh, but on the globe, so to say, the max the, the maps uh, uh, don't. Uh, uh, move in that sense, uh, but this way uh, one could have a dynamic GIS kind of representation uh, of the water bodies uh, also uh, representing the seasonality. A few more points and then we'll turn to the, 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 the question, the Q&A. Uh, it can answer some big questions. Uh, for example, as someone who's been involved and uh, very happily with NOAA Ocean Exploration, uh, Nicole's group, uh, 
there's the, the classic question when you go to a, a new place, to what extent does a newly explored region resemble other regions? And it's actually been hard biologically to answer that question, especially for the deep sea where, where trawls are hard and expensive. Uh, uh, the kinds of ocean exploration that we tend to do in the deep sea tend to be, to be visual with uh, cameras and so forth. Uh, the uh, uh, leaving traps for a year is very hard. Again, one has to go back. Whereas uh, collecting the water for eDNA, again, in the, in the Cayman Trench or the Puerto Rican Trench or, or Antarctica, uh, anywhere where it's hard to go, uh, uh, where, you see, and, and where one may cur be curious about whether a place one is exploring uh, for the first time, uh, it, is it like some other area? Uh, this is, can be a very uh, handy, quick way to say there is a strong family resemblance uh, of the, the new parcel of water that, that with uh, others that we've looked at. Similarly, there are questions about uh, how is climate changing marine ecosystems? How does pollution change marine ecosystems? How is increased protection, MPAs, changing marine ecosystems? Uh, again, this simply using the dominant species, uh, this kind of paradigm of the top 10, uh, whether fish or uh, could use others. Uh, this could be a very handy, quick way of, of showing uh, convincingly uh, in a replicable, reproducible uh, way that uh, uh, there's a before and after. Uh, very importantly, this will become more powerful and precise as the databases grow. In that sense, a bit like, uh, it's a bit like GPS and Waze and things like that. Uh, the the as the we've we have more and more samples uh, the we can do more and more in terms of uh, uh, precision and scale uh, and it will in this regard be extremely important that as the eDNA community does its work in coming years that we make sure that there are ways to to uh, pool our data uh, and keep it uh, I'll say open access uh, open science in that sense. Uh, uh, something which uh, NOAA itself has been promoting. So this can be an area where discovery value will grow as the, the, the pool data, whether it's for the Northwest Atlantic or the Gulf of Alaska, Alaska or the Northwest Hawaiian Islands or the Arctic, uh, as those pools of data grow, one will be able to answer more and more questions with this uh, uh, kind of approach. Uh, and uh, I would add, inevitably, uh, one can't give a talk nowadays without mentioning uh, AI and machine learning. It may be possible to, as the database in, uh, grows, for the AI and the machine learning itself, in fact, to generate in a completely inductive, bottom-up way, a new global marine uh, biogeography. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, I would say, for the younger people, that may be maybe 10 years in the future, but it's not infinitely far in the future. Uh, finally, I think uh, it will be fun and interesting to learn how, how biogeographies based on the dominant fish species uh, compare to, to others. Fish have the advantage now that the, the, the genetic genomic databases uh, have grown quickly, but of course there are other taxa that are extremely interesting and the 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 biogeographies of mollusks or of cephalopods or of other major taxa, important marine uh, taxa, uh, may prove different. And in that sense, uh, we may make important discoveries for basic science uh, as we, as we uh, uh, welcome additional uh, taxa with rich databases into, into the system. With that, I'll say uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, as uh, Mark mentioned, uh, we've had great cooperation uh, from, uh, from, from NOAA, from folks in, in Jersey uh, and in uh, the Gulf of Maine, also working with uh, Mike Coogan on software at the University of New Hampshire, and a longstanding cooperation uh, with Monmouth University uh, uh, across New York uh, uh, Harbor. Uh, in, in New Jersey. So thanks to all. Uh, we have some publications about, particularly about how the, the, the abundance works. And uh, we're, we're finishing up a paper now uh, about this concept, uh, uh, the, uh, the dominant species concept and marine biogeography. And we hope to uh, be submitting that to journals soon. Thank you.
Thank you, Jesse. And thank you, Mark, for your great presentations this afternoon. From here, we will go into some questions that have been posted in the questions for staff box. Um, we have a few in here and uh, we'll begin. So our first question is for Mark um, from Marissa, who asks, mm -hmm. have you applied your methods to offshore or open ocean sites? And do you think it could, or what challenges would you expect um, in that environment or open ocean environments? Uh, that's a really good question. We have not uh, applied it to open ocean uh, data. I think the, the major uh, challenge there is that uh, DNA concentrations or reading of the papers are relatively low. So you probably have to, to really get a sense of what's abundant and what's not. You probably have to do more higher volume the sampling in terms of water, but uh, but anyway, it's an environment we need to look at. If you know, if you're aware of any data sets uh, that uh, you know cover uh, fish with one of the broad range of primers, it's only be interested to look at those. Thanks, Mark. We have one more question for you, Mark. From it looks like Stephen. He says, great talk and very informative. Which gene regions do you plan to test next? Do you think uh, nuclear eDNA data will tell you similar patterns to your 12S uh, mitogenome RNA data? Uh, those are good questions. Uh, we're probably going to stay with mitochondrial 12S. Uh, uh, we've, uh, it's, uh, we have a sense of how that behaves. In terms of abundance, I haven't uh, seen data using nuclear genes for that. The, I think you're a hundredfold less in terms of copy number, so that might be the limiting factor of how much water you'd have to sample. But interesting question. Thanks, Mark. Um, this one is from Zach, who says, uh, to Mark and or Jesse. Um, great talk. Very cool to see the EDDS as a metric for common species being useful for biogeographic analysis. Professor Melody McGeo um, has developed the Zeta Diversity Framework to, to, to provide a holistic analysis suite that captures contributions of both common and rare species in the community to turnover. It is true that ecological network structure is maintained by a generalist core common species. However, rare species contr contribute sus sustainably, substantially to both species and functional diversity. Can you speak to them? Um, can you speak to the importance of rarity, especially in the context of hyper biodiverse systems with few dominant taxa? I, there are several questions in that, uh, you know, the approaches I said, it, we're deliberately ignoring the rare taxa, which are precisely the things that many people are interested in. Uh, I, in terms of uh, ecosystems that don't have dominant taxa, I don't, uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Perhaps these are tropical uh, systems. I haven't, we haven't looked at data sets from that uh, setting. Uh, the ecologists tell us that everywhere is a hollow curve. So, uh, but perhaps the uh, coral reefs are, are different. Uh, so so th those are uh, good questions. If you, uh, if you want to look at rare species, then you've got to look at it. There, there are a very small fraction of the metabolic uh, component of the ecosystem. I mean, we've got, you know, 90 or 95 or 98 percent of the eDNA, if you think that's a measure of abundance, in these coastal systems, temperate coastal systems, are in this top 10. Uh, I love rare species, but they're they're rare. I might add a little on that. Uh, rare species, of course, can be very important in the larger ecology, like the classic wolves in Yellowstone. 
kind of question. Uh, and there, the, the, there will be situations where one is interested in particular, the presence or absence of particular rare species, whether because of the, the, the a large ecological role like the wolf or because of extreme interest in a particular species, let's say like the, the coelacanth uh, as a very ancient, uh, interesting fish. But for uh, the, the bulk of the questions that we've mentioned, for trying to get a sense of the biogeography of the of the oceans, and one could say the Great Lakes or other other larger water bodies, uh, rarity is unlikely to be uh, the the main way to go. Uh, first, monitoring rarity is by definition extremely hard. Uh, you know whether it's whether it's by nets or scuba or DNA or uh, rare is you know the rarity is it's it's harder to find. So the effort that's involved, you know, if one, uh, uh, it's uh, you know, like the extreme difficulty of uh, the river dolphins in the Yangtze or the vaqueros, the vaquitas in the uh, uh, Gulf of California, you have to set up very large and expensive and frequent sampling to, uh, to try to capture those kinds of things. So the society can be very interested in rare species for a lot of reasons. But the reasons the reasons are unlikely to be the ones that we've mentioned, which is trying to get a macro picture of uh, parcels of water and how they may be changing. Uh, the uh, but it, I would also say it's not once we do the sampling, the, whenever as Mark showed, he's you know in, in our typical samples we're getting uh, uh, 40 or 50 different just fishes. And so and we, we do pick up, uh, and sometimes we do all mammals, but we do pick up dolphins uh, or whales. Uh, and so it, the samples that one would get, collect in order to follow the dominant species approach would uh, might well have the DNA of the rare species as well. And that would, those would go into the databases. Uh, but but the, obviously, if something shows up in one out of 10 samples, uh, it's it's giving you less information than something that shows up in 10 out of 10 as 30% uh, of the copies or reads. So uh, uh, it's not an either or question. Uh, there are reasons to be interested in rarity and particular monitoring strategies, observing strategies, uh, which uh, need to be in place uh, uh, for for uh, rarity. And uh, but for the this quest these big questions of uh, macro questions of how uh, parcels of water are uh, maybe changing, how, how to uh, characterize them in an efficient way. We think the, uh, uh, it's, it's keep your eyes on the common. Uh, with, uh, obviously having Noah on the, uh, as the sponsor of this, it's also important to point out that a species can only be a fishery, it can only be commercial if it's common. Uh, you know, it's, if, if there is, you know, the, the first the things that are very rare may be protected, but uh, it's also very hard to create a market for something uh, of which there are very, few, very, very few kilos. Uh, the, the most of the the species, whether whether scallops or or uh, haddock or whatever, that that will be the important uh, fisheries. Uh, that they have to be quite abundant, quite common. Uh, at the same time, if one only looks at the fishery species, one, if you looked at Mark's lists, uh, you, you miss all sorts of things, again, that are not target species for fisheries. So uh, we, we think this, this approach, uh, uh, I would say it's, it fits. Thanks. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Mark, for your input on that question. Our next question is from Catherine, who asks, can you talk more about how you plan to investigate habitat boundaries or mixed habitat sites? Uh, uh, we haven't planned, a, I don't have a specific, uh, we don't have a specific investigation uh, planned. Uh, ideally, we wanna get a lot of samples, so we need somewhere that, uh, through working with New Jersey DEP or other organizations that uh, <clears throat> we can get uh, the density of sampling you would need across a, a boundary. I, I mean, I think it's it's simple. I mean, you could take a boat and go from Maine to New Jersey and sample as you went along, but uh, actually lining up the 
uh, personnel and the equipment to do it. Uh, we don't have a specific plan yet. But we, yes, I would say we hope that as uh, NOAA's uh, monitoring, ocean monitoring, uh, increasingly assimilates and incorporates eDNA, that this will become part of what NOAA and its associated organizations, academic and, and other, can do, uh, whether it's in the Gulf of Alaska or the California Current or, or uh, uh, the Mid-Atlantic and the Gulf of Maine. Uh, again, as once as one has the data, uh, and again, this is an advantage of the common, of emphasizing the common, uh, if, if uh, the NOAA survey vessels simply collect water each time they stop to do a trawl, uh, that you're going to get what's common. You might not get what's very rare, but you're going to get what's common. So uh, in terms of, uh, again, sort of filling out the map with more and more data points, the kind of vision I tried to share at the end of the, you know, sort of ways uh, a ways of uh, of uh, common species, uh, uh, at least in the coastal region, uh, of the routine sampling that fishery services, uh, state and federal do, could really contribute a lot to this over the course of, let's say, the next four or five years. Thank, Thank you. you both for that. And that segues great into our next question. We do have quite a few questions today, um, so in only about nine more minutes, so hopefully we can get to a few more of them. Um, this one is from Cheryl, who uh, we, we can segue off of that last question into this one, who asks, are your eDNA samples taken from surface waters and what volume? Uh, uh, generally, everything's a liter uh, of water, unless uh, some of the seining uh, surveys are there's a lot of sediment in the water, uh, so we couldn't filter that much. Uh, the trawl survey, uh, in, in this details are in the publication, uh, half of the samples are at the surface and half are at, uh, uh, at depth, uh, and there's collected before the trawl was deployed. Uh, in, at this scale, we don't see a, a much difference between surface and depth in New Jersey, the deepest though is only about 30 meters. Thanks, Mark. Um, and I think you answered this next question, but I'll, I'll give you a chance to check on it. This one's from Charles who asks, was depth stratification considered in your creation of your EDDS profiles? Um, which I think you, if you, is there any else, anything else you'd like to elaborate there? No, it's a, it's a really important question. So. Uh, uh, just need to uh, do the sampling. It's in the main trawl survey, this is just trawl data, uh, they go out to 100 meter depth uh, and the shallowest is I think 10 meters. Uh, and if you compare, I forget what the breakdown is, but I'll say 10, 25, uh, 50, 100. There's no big difference in dominant species over that gradient, you know, so that's a, but that's a very particular system. Depth is, is really important. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Our next question is from Paula, who asks, since eDNA species analysis is dependent on public database completion, how can we make sure the barcoding efforts continue specifically in offshore regions? Uh, that's a, a very Thank important, you. yeah, that's a, an important uh, uh, point. The uh, first, I, I would say the Ocean Biodiversity Information System is now accepting barcode and eDNA data. And it could, if it, 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 as a framework, it could succeed at assimilating a lot of this, these data over the next few years. That, that's, a, that's a global framework. But of course, the requirement or the habit, the custom of doing this will largely happen at the national and regional level. So a lot will depend on, let's say in the US, NOAA or NSF or ONR uh, or in Canada, DFO, encouraging PIs uh, and in some cases requiring them to deposit the data in, in certain ways that the data will, it will be possible to fuse and pool uh, the data. It's a non-trivial, the effort 
to, as all of us know, the, the effort to write good data management plans and then to implement them is non-trivial. And it's a, it's a cost of doing research uh, and doing surveys. And we, we shouldn't hide that. Uh, if we want to build these kinds of databases, there will be costs and we, we need to be honest and transparent about that with, with the agencies, uh, entities that uh, uh, provide the support. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse, and thanks, Mark, for that one. All right, quite a few questions to go through. So um, let's see. This one's from Katie, who says, great talk. Um, with the RIAs primers, uh, how much off-target amplification do you typically get? Um, with the MyFish 12S, uh, Katie has had issues with amplification of bacterial sequences. Uh, it's, uh, it's a question for all primer sets. Uh, I'll just say about the MyFish, if you're having trouble with it, we have published a modification of the MyFish primers that uh, the, the sort of uh, right hand end that gets rid of almost, in our experience, almost all the bacterial amplification. Uh, it's in one of these three papers here. Uh, RIAS is, it, it, uh, we don't get a lot of off-target amplification, except it picks up all the human DNA that's in your sample, which since we're doing coastal regions, including East River in New York, is often, uh, there's often a, a large amount of uh, human DNA. But at the read depth that we're doing, uh, it doesn't end up uh, causing a problem. So you can there there are modifications of the MyFish primers that might help you with the bacterial. Thanks, Mark. Um, and we will end with this last question who by Catherine who asks uh, for Jesse, what would be the best approach for publishing eDNA observations so that they could be easily incorporated into these biogeographic mapping efforts? What repository format, etc.? NOAA itself does have its own uh, data repositories. Uh, it's unrealistic to think all of these data will end up in with full metadata in, in GenBank, but of course GenBank in general accepts a lot of genomic data. Uh, but Nicole, before we end, you might mention or post in the in the chat or something the, the website for the, uh, the, uh, the NOAA data repository. Uh, I would also mention that there are organizations like DataCite, uh, C-I-T-E, there are a number of now new NGOs that are trying to encourage improved habits and customs uh, so that these, these issues will be less uh, serious in the future. Uh, the Center for Open Science, COS, is another like that. So there are uh, at least some new resources to, to help in this way. Thanks. Nate, Nicole, yes. would you like to mention? Let, <clears throat> let, if I might just say before ending, uh, especially for the younger people on, on the call, I think there's a really big scientific opportunity here. Uh, creating a new biogeography of uh, Earth's oceans for, in a bottom-up way with millions uh, of, uh, tens of millions of data points, uh, it's a fantastic, immense, wonderful opportunity and will be extremely important as we want to understand better whether it's uh, marine effects of marine debris or or climate change or wind farms. Uh, and uh, so for those of you out there who are like to think big and uh, can think uh, you know, 10, 12 years in the future, uh, I would say really think about this. There's There are big opportunities to create, to make major scientific uh, contributions, citation classics. There should be funding for this uh, and lots of promotions. Thanks. Well, I could. I don't think I could say it much better myself. Thank you, Jesse Ozabel and Mark Stokel for your great presentation today. Thank you very much for your time and everybody for attending. We will see you at our next seminar series. If you have yet or or um. I've yet to join the NOAA Omics 
mailing list, please do so. You can find it on our NOAA Omics website, linked in the chat. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. We'll see everybody next time.